This is USBI News, your Virgin Islands connection. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us for USBI News. I'm Emily Matson. On St. Thomas, police are investigating a deadly shooting which took the life of one person and injured several others. It happened Wednesday around 11.40 p.m. VIPD officers responded to a report of shots fired at the manual bar in content. They arrived to find several people had been shot. Investigators learned a vehicle drove up to the building and someone inside that vehicle opened fire into the building. An off-duty police officer was inside the bar at the time and drew his weapon engaging the suspects to try to protect himself and the others inside. In all, four people inside the bar, including three males and a woman, were injured by gunfire. They were treated at the hospital. Another gunshot victim was found dead in Upper Content. He's been identified as 41-year-old Henry Richards Jr. Detectives are asking anyone with any information to call police, the crime tip line, or Crime Stoppers VI. Despite the pandemic and supply chain issues, the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture says the AG industry has remained resilient. But on Thursday, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle, including VI Congresswoman Stacey Plaskett, put him in the hot seat, saying more needs to be done for rural America. Our U.S. VI News Washington, D.C. correspondent Rachel Knapp reports. The Secretary of Agriculture told congressional members even though they're seeing record exports and an increase in farm income, the way the rural economy is running needs to change. Our extraction economy is an economy that essentially uh, we take things from the land and off the land and unfortunately rather than converting them and value adding them in and close to the rural areas where the natural resource is, they are transported uh, to long distances where they are uh, value added in some other location where opportunities and jobs are created elsewhere. And says instead the department wants to focus on creating more local and regional opportunities to create jobs and keep the wealth where it's being created, suggesting they could do this by expanding processing capacities for local producers. The need for our cattle producers, our livestock producers, our hog producers to have choice and opportunity for a local processing facility that creates local jobs that allows that revenue and wealth that's created from processing to stay in the community. Congresswoman Stacy Plaskett tried to get data on the effectiveness of current ag grants and programs have on helping small-scale farming and herding in U.S. territories. Has the program been successful at reducing food insecurity and developing local food systems in these communities? But the secretary didn't give any specific quantifiable data on the success of these programs. Farmers, ranchers, and foresters and consumers are battling significant supply chain disruptions and rising energy and input costs, increasing inflation, and long-standing long labor shortages. And these strains exacerbate the ongoing challenges of production agriculture. Congressman Glenn Thompson worries that more regulations can hurt the ag industry. But the secretary says he's willing to work with members to help grow rural America and address these issues. In Washington, D.C., Rachel Knapp, USVI News. Now to the latest coverage of coronavirus. Active COVID-19 cases here in the territory remain steady from a day ago. According to the latest numbers from the VI Department of Health, there are more than 1,400 COVID cases territory-wide, with 778 active cases on St. Croix, 582 on St. Thomas, and 96 on St. John. 400 million N95 masks are set to go out to the public for free. White House officials have announced a new program set to get high quality masks to those who need them by next month. Here's more on how you can get one and how long experts say you can wear the mask before you should toss it. Overall in the U.S., the Omicron case wave may have reached its peak, but not in every state and hospitalizations are holding steady. In an effort to slow the spread, White House officials will make 400 million N95 masks available to the public as early as next week. They'll be available at uh, community health centers and pharmacies and locations around the country, uh, and they'll start shipping very soon. And if you want to get one, you can go to your local pharmacy and pick one up. Some health experts say N95 masks may provide better protection than ones made of cloth. So how long can you wear the mask before tossing it? Lindsay Marr, a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Virginia Tech, says she wears hers for a week. The most important thing to do is to make sure that it seals well all the way around your face. Um, that includes bending the nose bridge to fit your 
nose. To reuse N95 masks as safely as possible, Moore says to avoid touching the front outer part of the mask when putting it on. Instead, handle it by the edges or straps. If the mask becomes damp, visibly dirty, bent, creased, or damaged, even from makeup, replace it. The longer you wear an N95 mask, the more contaminated it becomes. Setting it in the sunlight for several hours may help particles die off, but never put it in the microwave. And these masks should never be washed as water makes them ineffective. Good to know. Mar says N95 masks are not made for kids because they are designed for adult faces. But older children may be able to wear a small adult size. Well, the Better Business Bureau is issuing, issuing a warning about fake COVID-19 testing sites. It comes as high demand for the tests are leading to a surge in mobile COVID-19 testing cats, testing tents rather, and vans on street curbs and sidewalks across some places in the country. Health officials are also sounding the alarm about these pop-up businesses and websites selling those at-home tests, saying you could be putting your health money in data at person, personal data at risk. Here's how to avoid getting scammed. Not all testing centers are created equal. The Better Business Bureau is issuing a warning about fake COVID-19 testing sites popping up across the country. We've noticed an uptick in complaints and uh, reviews at various different testing sites around the United States. The BBB says high demand for tests and scarce supply has opened the doors to bad actors. And health officials say that's putting consumers at risk for identity theft, inaccurate or missing test results, and financial losses. That's the real risk right now, um, that people are going to, to get your personal information and then uh, take that and try and get more money out of you. This is really something that government needs to step in to deal with. But with some states having a hard time keeping up their oversight, how do you avoid getting scammed? The BBB recommends you do these three things. Number one, do your research. Check the Virgin Islands Department of Health's website to find authorized, no-cost testing sites in your area. Number two, read the fine print on any documentation you are asked to sign. If it appears that they're requesting things such as your social security number, your driver's license, or your insurance card, you might want to start asking questions. And finally, watch out for look-alike websites. Fake facilities often spoof sites to make them look like well-known and trusted companies or even a government site. Remember, you can request free COVID-19 tests from the government at covidtests.gov. Two of the USVI's top golfers are teeing it up against the best players at the Latin America Amateur Championship this week in the Dominican Republic. Our hometown golfers representing the territory are taking on some of the best golfers in the world, competing against 102 golfers. Our USVI News, Ali Bourne-Vinak, is following the team this week in the Dominican. She spoke with the USVI Golf Federation about this exciting week. Kevin, how are things going today? It's wonderful, man. It's nice to be out here and, and you know, get an opportunity to watch uh, Joseph Lee perform out here. Yep. Got the right attitude, I think, you know. This is quite the experience for yep. him, and I think he's. I think we're gonna see good things from him. We're gonna see amazing things from him. He's got it all. He's got the talent. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of golf left, and we have Kevin O'Connell, who's teeing off in the afternoon. Right, and you know, Kev, Kevin is a veteran, so you know, yep. he, like I said, he's played in four days. This is his fifth one, so you know, he's, he's you know, he's pumped. He's geared up he's, for this. He's, he's ready. Yeah, yeah, he's ready to be up there. <laughs> yeah. You know. Well, cool. Well, on, on that note. Let's go check things out over here. Uh, Joe's teen off on the next nine, and we got Kevin O'Connell coming up. And Allie will be keeping us posted from the Dominican Republic as she follows the team. Exciting news for them, for sure. Also exciting news for Jamaica. For the first time in over two decades, Jamaica's bobsled team has qualified for the Winter Olympics. The Olympics kick off in just over two weeks now. And for the first time in 24 years, Jamaica will have a four-man bobsled team at the 2022 Winter Olympic Games. The Caribbean country secured one of the last spots. The foursome hopes to bring some fire to the ice in Beijing. Jamaica's first Olympic bobsled team back in 1988 inspired the popular movie Cool Runnings. And now this year, 
A new group is hoping to build on that legacy. Good stuff. We'll keep you posted on how they do. A look at your local forecast is straight ahead here on USBI News. Plus, the pandemic has changed the way we live in so many ways. And that is meant for boost in business for Airbnbs. We'll explain why when USBI News comes right back. The pandemic is changing the way we travel and work. Because so many companies are allowing employees to work remotely, more and more people are finding they can still get their paycheck while exploring new places. Reporter Michael George brings us more. Taylor Gill gets paid to help other people become digital nomads like her, working while traveling the world. Right now I'm actually in Medellin, Colombia. And in the fall, I was able to visit Cape Town, South Africa, Kalifi, Kenya, Las Palmas, Canary Islands. With millions of employees able to work remotely, more and more are choosing to untether themselves from a home base. The longer this pandemic goes on, the more the world never goes back to the way it was. And that means travel isn't going back to the way it was. Airbnb says nearly half the nights booked from last July to September were for stays of seven days or longer. And a fifth of its business is now people staying longer than a month. On Tuesday, Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky started his stay at an Atlanta area Airbnb. He plans to move to a different town every couple of weeks to get a feel for nomad living. And I want to really test the experience, optimize it, and show that you can actually run a really big company doing this, and it means a lot of people can do this. Gill started living as a digital nomad in 2018. She's seen the community grow exponentially since the pandemic began. The flexibility to travel and be in different places this allows you to have new experiences outside of work every day. She says a hybrid approach is also gaining popularity, traveling four to six months a year while still maintaining a home. Yeah, some great opportunities out there for sure. Airbnb says its third quarter revenue last year of $2.2 billion was its highest ever and 36% higher from the, from the same period in 2019. Still ahead here on USBI News, we're going to bring you news from across the Caribbean, heading to Puerto Rico where a big move is allowing the territory to get out of a big chunk of its debt, helping with its economic crisis. We'll explain what it all means straight ahead in just two minutes. In a historic decision, a federal judge approved a plan to restructure Puerto Rico's debt. The plan of adjustment reduces the debt by 80 percent and saves Puerto Rico more than $50 million in debt service payments. It's the largest such deal in U.S. history. Our USBI News' Francis Felix tells us more. Federal District Judge Laura Taylor Swain confirmed the plan of adjustment that will serve to modify $33 million in central government obligations. This is the first debt modification of a state government in the United States and the largest restructure in the municipal debt market. The decision implies from the outset that the pension of some 167,000 retired public employees will remain intact and that if the government faces any deficit, there will be a trust capitalized with some 1 million to pay that obligation anyway. It also implies that thousands of public employees will recover the savings that they have contributed for their retirement for years. According to the president of the Financial Oversight Management Board for Puerto Rico, David Scale, and the agency's executive director, Natalie Jaresco, the restructuring approved by the judge means in reality a second chance so that using the federal promise law, Puerto Rico has become moved in five years from a stagnant to a stability and now with the confirmation of the PDA to prosperity. The Puerto Rico Teachers Association tender against the judge ruling by indicating that this approval includes changes to the retirement of teachers without offering them any remedy or benefit. 
Governor Pedro Pierluisi made expressions of approval. We are facing a transcendental moment in which the government of Puerto Rico is hidden to end the bankruptcy process and concentrate on returning to the progress that our people expect and deserve. The agreement, also not perfect, is very good for Puerto Rico and protects our pensioners, the University of Puerto Rico, and other municipalities which serve our people. From Washington, resident commissioner Jennifer Gonzalez also celebrated the decision. With the confirmation of the PDA, one of the most important steps is taken for Puerto Rico to get ahead economically and get rid of of one of the crudest indicators of our colonial condition, say the commissioner. The Financial Oversight Management Board has about 60 days of intense activity, including returning to the legislature so that the debt adjustment plan will be executed. From Rio Piedras, Puerto Rico, Frances Félix.